privilege to be here tonight. Preacher, thank you for letting me come. I'm sorry that I had to cancel out the meeting, but just about the time I was supposed to be here, I was laid in a hospital bed waiting for him to come get me and take me to do that uh, surgery. <clears throat> so just about the time when I was scheduled to be here. So I'm glad I got the way. <laughs> We're going to Exodus chapter 3 tonight, if you'll turn there. Exodus chapter 3. I have enjoyed being in Mississippi. It's just been a blessing. I go back to uh, uh, Nashville, Tennessee tomorrow, have lunch with my wife, and then I'm off to Atlanta, Georgia for Sunday. This is my sixth meeting since my surgery, and uh, I am looking forward to uh, Sunday after Sunday now from here on out for a while. Look in verse 1, Exodus chapter 3. Now, Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the backside of the desert, and he came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. And moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Now this is one of the Bible classics. This is something that most of us uh, uh, first heard when we were in the beginner department of the Sunday school. If you uh, had the privilege to be raised by folks who took you to church when you were a child, you probably started uh, learning this uh, in the beginner department, and then you heard it again in the primary department, and you heard it again in the uh, intermediate department. And, and the, the, this classic, this is something like... Um, you know, Noah's Ark, everybody knows all about Noah's Ark. And we know about Daniel in the lion's den and the Hebrew children in the fiery furnace and, and David fighting with Goliath and the crossing of the Red Sea and the plagues of Egypt and, and all. And, and so we're familiar with this. But now there, there's a little bit of a problem with familiarity in the Bible. We get to the place where we get used to it. And uh, it's old stuff. Been there, done that, got the T-shirt. I've heard it and heard it and heard it. So when they start talking about it, we yawn and say, yeah, I know about that. So, uh, so I can be thinking about something else. Uh, <clears throat> somehow we've got to realize that every time we get into the Bible and any verses of Scripture, I've got to learn how important it is that it be fresh and personal and new. And one of the ways you can do that is to project yourself into the story when you read this. Tonight I want you to be Moses. If you get in the lion's den with Daniel and you can imagine yourself in there and these wild lions and they're, you know, they're, they're growling and they're just circling you and you can see their teeth and their claws and the saliva starting to drip off their chin and everything and you're not sure just exactly when and what's going to happen, you know, and, and you, you need to build up a tenseness and need it. And, and if, you could, if you could enter into this thing, think about Daniel down in there. If you could be Daniel in the story, suddenly that, 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 that story will take on brand new meaning. But our problem is we say, look, that, that's, that's 10,000 miles away from here. And that is, uh, that's 4,000 years ago. Now, what in the world does that have to do with me here tonight in Mississippi? Well, now, do you agree with me? Your Bible says the same thing my Tennessee Bible says, that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be truly furnished unto all good works. Question, is that little story about Moses and the burning bush a part of all Scripture? Yeah, yeah, it is. So all scripture is given for me and you here tonight. And this is just as much for here tonight as it was 4,000 years ago, 10,000 miles away from here. Uh, the Bible says in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, two paces in that chapter, it says, The things that happened to those people back there in the Old Testament happened unto them for our in samples. God said, I put that in the Bible for you. So what does this mean to you? Does this have a message for you tonight? It has a message for everybody here. And if somehow I could figure out what it is. You remember that old passage over and over and over in the Bible? It says, he'd have near to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith 
of the churches. And the Lord has something, and I hope everybody will get a little something that nobody wasted their time coming to the service tonight. Now, I want you to put yourself in the story, and, and you be Moses, if you will. Now, in verse 1, it says, and you keep your Bible open there, because we're going to work our way down through it and have a little Bible study here. And it says, Moses was out uh, <coughs> taking care of the sheep of Jethro and his father-in-law. Somebody tell me how many sheep we got there. I have no idea. Uh, you know, uh, how much is Moses getting paid to do? I don't know. Uh, his wife, Zippor, where is she? Well, we know that she's back with her father, Jethro. And whatever children they have at that time, they're all back there. And how much money is he getting paid? I don't know. He's probably getting house rent free. And, and uh, Jethro's feeding the wife and kids and all. And getting some kind of salary. And we, we don't know a whole lot, but we do know some things about it. But uh, in verse 1 it says, he came to the back side of a desert. That's the first thing to notice. It's the back side of a desert. wonder if anybody here has ever been on the back side of a desert. It's got a very interesting trait. Uh, it, uh, we, we have an expression up in Murfreesboro where I live. I think you could pick up on it pretty quick. We say, uh, uh, it was so still that you could hear a pin drop. Yeah, that's quiet. And uh, now sheep don't make noise, and uh, they're just so quiet. Now, well, I don't know if you've ever been on the front side of a desert, but it's pretty quiet on the front side of a desert. But you get on the back side of a desert, it's really, really quiet. Now that means there are no airports nearby with jet planes taking up off right over your house. A lot of us know about that. There's no train tracks anywhere near this with rumbling trains going by, click clicking on those rail joints. We don't have any expressways here with big tractor and trailers hitting those cement bumps and bump, bump, bump. I live in motels most of the time, and I know about those trains, and I know about those truck, tractor, and trailers, and I know about those jet airplane noises and all that, but none of that in this story. It's, it's really quiet. And then there are <clears throat> no playgrounds here. We don't have any children's noises in this story. And we have no televisions blaring in this story and we have no radios going in this story we don't even have computers in this story i mean it's way out there and it's quiet and just as easy in the back side of the desert and you can hear a pin drop and then it says and he came to the mountain of god i wonder how that place got its name I have no idea. It, it's associated with the seven mountains, uh, including Mount Sinai. And that's labeled as the place where God came down and the mountain caught on fire because the holiness of God touched the sin-cursed earth and there was reaction. That's the thing that would happen if you suddenly in your physical body got into the presence of the Shekinah glory of God. You would melt. You'd probably explode like a hydrogen bomb. That's why we have to be buried and resurrected with a glorified body. And that's why you have to be changed at the rapture in order to get in the presence of God. You couldn't possibly exist, you see. And, and so, in this case, uh, one of those mountains somehow is labeled God's mountain. Uh, that's God's place. God is identified there. Now, somewhere in the past, when you finish this auditorium, uh, probably it was the pastor who stood here in the pulpit and said, Now, ladies and gentlemen, we're gathered here today to dedicate this auditorium to the Lord. And we've gathered here to thank God for it. And we want to commit this auditorium to the Lord. What does that mean? Well, that means we're not going to have any <clears throat> barn dances in here. That means we're not going to have any gambling going on in here. We're going to go play bingo in here. And uh, we're not going to have any rock and roll going on in here. And we're not going to have, uh, we're not going to have no beer drinking in here. See, and, and all that stuff. This is God's place. We have set this aside and this is the place we come and we come to meet with God. And to worship God. And so this is, this is God's place. And what we did, we came in here tonight and we sang and we listened to the children sing. And we heard these young people sing. And we had prayer together and I opened the Bible and read. And we quieted ourselves down and we got as quiet as a mouse or as you could hear a pin drop. So both of those characteristics in verse 1 are just as true here right now tonight as it was 10,000 years ago and 4,000 miles away. And it says now in verse 2 says, And the angel of the Lord appeared unto Moses in the burning bush. <laughs> now, can you, yeah, now you got to be Moses. 
Uh, can you imagine? Every time you see an angel show up in the Bible, the first thing that comes out of his mouth is, Fear not. Don't be afraid. I mean, it petrified people. Uh, you you want to understand? You want to know how that must have felt? Uh, what would you do if suddenly an angel, but let's suppose while I'm talking, suddenly a big eight-foot angel just showed up right there on the platform, glowing at about 50,000 watts. <laughs> what would happen? I'll tell you the first thing that happened, I'd stop talking. <laughs> I'll tell you the second thing that happened, I'd stop breathing. <laughs> and probably you would too. Uh, you know, I, I remember when I was a little boy, I don't know how to interpret this, and I don't know whether to believe it or not, but I do believe it, and you don't have to believe it. But I slept in a room with three brothers, and across the hall was another bedroom with my two sisters. And my mom and dad slept downstairs, and my, my mom came about 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning, and she came running up the steps, and she shook my older brother, Hobart, and said, Hobart, Hobart, are you all right? Yeah, yeah, well, what's the matter? He was rubbing his eyes, and she shook me. I'm number two in the family. She shook me. Tommy, Tom, you okay? Yeah, yeah, mom, I'm okay. Well, what's the matter? Uh, never mind. Uh, uh, Kurt, are you all right, Kurt? Yeah, yeah, Mom. How about you, Wilton? Yeah, yeah. She ran across the hall. Margaret, you okay? Yeah, Mom. Evelyn, uh, what, Mom? You okay? Mom went back downstairs. All of us tossing around, and we all went back to sleep. Next morning at breakfast, said, Mom, Mom, what's going on? I don't know, she said. She said, but a big old angel was standing on the foot of my bed. And she said, I was sure I had read somewhere. She wasn't much in the way of a biblical knowledge. But she said, I read or somewhere or I heard a preacher say that the angel of the Lord came and carried some man away to heaven. You remember? And then she said, I just thought sure the angel had come and got one of you kids. Now I thought she was dead and I'd come to see. Now, I, I don't know what happened. But I know one thing. I get goosebumps just talking about it. It just petrified me to think about next morning we just sat there with our eyes open you know because mom said an angel came later on mom was trying to put that all together she said tom you know i've been thinking about that for years she said i, I don't know but she said, you're the only one to end up being a preacher i think maybe the lord might have come and touched you that night to make you a preacher <laughs> I, I don't know that's not very biblical so i'm not going to build any foundations on it but I talk, you talk about grabbing us now. None of us kids ever forgot that. Now, let, if this angel shows up, you know what would happen as soon as we got through with the service? There'd be a little pocket of people right over there. And there'd be a little pocket over there and over in here and over there and back in there and back in there and out there on the parking lot. And we'd be whispering to one another. And we'd just kind of slide off and go home. And then Sunday when you came, <clears throat> you wouldn't be able to find a place to park. And when you came in the building, even if you did find a place to park, you wouldn't be able to get in this auditorium. Because everybody would be here to see if an angel might be going to come again. Now, think about how it must have affected Moses. Suddenly, there is an angel. And it showed up. And Moses said that when the bush caught on fire, verse 2 says, the bush burned and 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 burned, but it didn't burn up. No smoke was going up from it. It was just glowing and glistening and just burning, a fiery burning, but it was not being consumed. I saw something in that, personal. I began to realize that we have another old expression that I've thought about all my life. I remember up in Elkton, Maryland, years ago in my first church, we got to thinking about this revival meeting we had, and I'll tell you, some of our folks got real fired, and we said, I'll tell you, old Joe, he really caught on fire for God. What does that mean? When a guy catches on fire, we simply mean he, he, got, he got fired up. He got stirred. I had a French lady in my church, and she wasn't used to all of our expressions and everything. She hadn't been in America very long. And I got up one Sunday, and I said, what we need is we need for this church to catch on fire. <laughs> and she came up after and said, uh, Pastor Wallace, why would you want your church to burn down? <laughs> she just didn't get it. Okay, but we understand, don't we, when somebody catches on fire? When they, they they get excited, they get stirred, we say we get a revival going in our heart. I mean, this it gets exciting. The music sounds better than it ever has before. Praying brings tears to our eyes. The Bible is fresher than it's ever been. And suddenly it opens up and we start seeing some things we haven't seen before. And, and, and you know, when you get on fire. And, and the Bible says it burned and burned and burned, but it wasn't consumed. And I found out that it does not consume you when you burn for God. I've gone into the pulpit over and over again, tired and weary and worn out. And sometimes sick. 
and I get better in the pulpit. It just energizes you. When you get up and start preaching, it just energizes you. Suddenly you get more energy. In fact, I get hyper. And when I get, I get through preaching and giving the invitation, man, I get all through and getting ready to go, and I'm going to take my wife out to a Sunday lunch, you know, right after church. We go out to the car in the parking lot. She says, oh, no, no, you get over in the, in the passenger seat. You're not driving. You're too hyper. You're going to have a wreck and kill us. And she won't let me drive it on Sunday. Now, you know, um, this, this been the, it, it doesn't burn up energy. It gives you energy. Yeah. And uh, if, if you're weary and tired and everything, get your Bible and come to church and sing some songs and, and enter in and become a part of it. And you go out of here with a longer cane. You'll be energized. That, that, it doesn't burn up energy. Uh, it gives you energy. And then I'll tell you something else it'll do. Uh, if you catch on fire and burn for God, it won't burn up your time. If you'll take time out for God and come to Sunday school, morning service, Sunday night, Wednesday night, when you're having special meetings, if you'll give that time to God, I'm going to guarantee you on the authority of the Word of God that you will have more time to get your stuff done than you would if you take that time and use it for yourself. I've had, uh, you know, I pastored three big churches, and all of them grown big. They didn't were no big start, but they all grew big. And I, I if I'm my, me and one of my old boys say, preacher got me my hay's out in the field, man. I won't be able to come to me. you got to get the hay in. I'm telling you, if you'll put God first, <clears throat> you'll get more hay in than you would otherwise. I'm going to guarantee you that. Yeah, man, i I, I got to get a battery put in my car. And so my woman says, I, man, i got to do the wash at home. I'm not going to be able to. Does your Bible say the same thing mine does? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. And the Bible says if you will have your life, you must lose it. And if you try to have your life, you will lose it. But if you'll lose your life, the Bible says you'll have it. If you haven't learned that principle yet, it will not burn up your time. It won't burn up your energy, and then it won't burn up your money either. If you'll obey the Bible about tithing and giving offerings, you'll have more money than you would otherwise. That's what the Bible teaches. And if you don't believe that, then you don't believe the Bible. You've got to believe the Bible about this. Because prosperity depends upon obedience to the temple principles of the Bible. Bring your tithes into the storehouse and prove me. Try me out. See if I'm kidding about this or telling you the truth. If I won't open up the window of heaven and give you more than you can care for. Anybody like to have more than you can handle? Yeah, he said, I'll give it to you. Success and prosperity and all that stuff is all wrapped up. So it doesn't burn up your time, doesn't burn up your energy, it won't burn up your money. The bush burned and burned and burned and burned, but it wasn't consumed. And if you'll burn and burn and get a good revival going, it'll energize you and it'll give you more time and give you more money and you'll have more of everything. Well, the bush burned and burned and burned. And Moses said, verse 3, I will now turn aside and see this great sight. Why the bush is not consumed. Now you get the picture. Here are these sheep over here. I don't know. Let's say 25, 30, 50, 60, 70, 80 sheep. I don't know. Doesn't matter. He didn't tell us. And I guess it didn't matter. Now there's the sheep. That's Moses' secular job. I don't know about you, but I'm not going to have one ounce of respect for Moses unless he gives us eight hours work for eight hours pay. Do you believe the Christian ought to be honest about his labor and his work? And if he's getting so much an hour to do that job, he ought not to be a shirker and lazy and try to cut corners and everything and try to cheat from his boss and all that. Well, it would be a good testimony to the Lord. So Moses, well, I think you understand, Moses, that there's a big old lion laying down there behind a rock. He's just waiting for you to goof off, lay down against the tree and go to sleep over here. And he's going to sneak up there and get one of those little lambs and drag it off down there. And as Amos 3.10 says, when he gets through chewing on it, there won't be anything left but a, a, two legs and a piece of an ear. And, uh, and, and now Moses, you, you got, and probably over on, on the other side of there is a big old tiger laying on it. He's just waiting to. So you got to be diligent, buddy. This is this Moses sheep. They, they need to be cared for. But over here, this angel shows up, sets this bush on fire, and suddenly he's standing here between sheep and, and the burning bush. Now, this is God. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and God of Jacob. So this is the spiritual. And this is the secular. All of us have our secular responsibilities. And Moses said... I'm going to turn aside, and I'm going to see this great sight, why that bush is not being consumed. Now, 
what he's doing is making a choice between the spiritual and the secular. And uh, seek ye first priority on the things of God and your sheep will be better off than they would otherwise. If you haven't learned that, please, please learn that. Because you're cheating yourself and your life will not be near what it could be if you'll learn, if you'll give God first. You'll be better off your sheep or whatever it is that you have to do in the secular world. Now, if you want your life, okay, you're going to lose that. If you put this first, forget that. And if you don't have the favor of God, you're not going to grow old happy. You're going to be miserable and cantankerous. <clears throat> you know, I had a Sunday school class uh, after I resigned from my church and turned it over to a sharp young fellow who's done a great job. <clears throat> and uh, I kept this auditorium class, and I had 160 senior citizens in my uh, auditorium class. And these, uh, all, you know, all of us old fogies in there together, you know. And I got up there and I told them, and I said, now look, <clears throat> I want to give you a lesson on growing old happy. And, and, I, and I said, now look, if, you, if you're not careful, I said, if you don't build your spirituality and learn these Bible principles, you're going to grow old, cantankerous and fussy and hard to get along with, and you have pain, you're going to cry and moan, groan, and you're going to grumble to your kids, and they'll get tired of it, and they're going to stick you off in the nursing home somewhere, and, and they won't come see you about once a month, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to be your fault. Now, what I want to do, I want to teach you how to be so happy and so fulfilled and everything that your kids will beg and plead with you to come stay with them. And I said, I've got four kids. And and I, I said, i tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to work it out. Uh, my wife had died, and I was by myself at that time. And I said, i tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to go down to Debbie's, and I'm going to hang around with, down there with Debbie and Dave for a month. And I'm going to be I'm going to be such a happy old man, and I'm going to be such a victorious, positive, definite kind of person that I tell Debbie, uh, Debbie, I'm getting ready to leave. I'm going down to Tom's in Dallas. And, and oh, No, Daddy, no, no, I don't want you to go you stay here and I want her to cry and beg and plead me to stay there and then, no no I got to share with the other kids so I go down to Tom's and I spend a month with him and I tell him I'm getting ready to leave and he begs me and his wife says no no you stay here with us and I, I make my way all through for him and I said I want my kids to beg and plead with me to stay with them and they beg me and want me to come and just live with them I said now I want all four of them begging me and pleading me. I don't want none of them to say no nah, no nah, dad we don't and after I got through with that lesson, one of my guys came up and said, Preacher, sure I'll tell you how you can get that all worked out for if you want to. I said, all right, tell me. He said, you tell them kids that you're going to spend a month with each one of them, and then you're going to rotate back and forth, and you tell them that wherever you are when you die, they get all the money. <laughs> Guess that might work, huh? <laughs> that old boy had a carnal mind, didn't he? <laughs> Okay. All right. Now, the Bible says that the bush burned, but it wasn't consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside and see this great sight. So he made his decision in favor of the spiritual and see why this bush did not burn. And the next verse ought to just jar your socks off. He says, when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, then God spoke. And I want to tell you that if he hadn't have turned aside, God wouldn't have spoke. Right. And you'd have the end of the story right there, and Moses wouldn't be in your Bible. Right. Okay? And if you don't turn aside, you won't be in God's plan either. If you, don't, if you don't respond when God speaks to you about that particular position, that class, or that bus route, or that deacon, or that choir, or that usher, or whatever it is, if, if you don't turn aside when God calls, you're going to miss it. And you're going to miss joy and happiness and contentment and satisfaction and provision and blessing. And you're not going to grow all happy and you're not going to know what life. And when you get to the end of it, you're going to say, and I wish I could go back and do this old rotter. Life's just not been really happy. Instead of saying, man, I'll tell you, life has been wonderful and full. And all of this, and I get to go to heaven too. You see? Now think about it here. When the Lord saw. Uh, preacher, when I read that verse, I get scared. I, get, I wonder how many times I've missed it. I was busy. I had my sheep. i got to take care of my sheep. And as a result of it, God didn't tell me about two and a half, three million people down there. He just didn't bring that up. In this case, Moses turned aside. And as soon as he did, the Lord said, Moses, Moses. Now, now wait a minute. Is that how he said it? 
I don't know how you read the Bible, but, but when I read this, I thought, now, God spoke. This is Almighty God. Now, God, according to the doctrine book in Bible school, they taught me God is omnipotent, omnitotal, all, complete, potent, powerful. God is total power. And he's omnipresent. He's totally everywhere all at the same time and all of time. He, he's, he's been there and he always will be there and he's everywhere at the same time. Omnipresent. And omnipotent. He knows everything about everybody and about everything that there is in creation. And, and I imagine God's getting ready to say something. He's getting ready to call Moses. Moses, Moses. I can just picture God. I, in my mind, I pictured God standing on this great big cloud. He's about 15 or 20 feet high, and he's got his hands all stretched out, you know, up toward heaven. And here's Almighty God. Just picture Almighty God standing out on this big old cloud. And over on that cloud, right next to him, is about a hundred big, beautiful angels with big silver trumpets just waiting on the signal. And over on that cloud is about a hundred big old angels with big silver drums with their drumsticks waiting. And God points and you hear a drum roll that would just like vibration of thunder for, through the universe. The loudest thunderous noise you ever heard in your life. That big drum roll. And then he points over there and you hear a blast that's never been equaled. And then God makes his announcement. Moses! What do you think? <laughs> Mo <laughs> you imagine? I mean, that this is God talking. Or did God say, Moses, Moses? Or did he say, Moses, Moses? Well, I don't know. It doesn't say. But I found out, and probably you have too, you will never ever come up with a question in the Bible or about the Bible that you won't find an answer to that question somewhere else in the Bible. There are no unanswered questions. And you will never find a problem that doesn't have a solution in the Bible. And you'll never find any kind of circumstance or situation in your life that doesn't have some kind of advice and counsel in the Bible. Everything's covered in the Bible. It's total, complete. It's God's book. And so I scanned through the Bible. Now I've been studying the Bible for 62 years. I got saved when I was 20 years old and I've been saved for 62 years and I started preaching almost immediately. And you think about now, I scanned through the Bible and I remembered that story of Elijah under that juniper tree. You remember that? Elijah was out there feeling sorry for himself. And suddenly the Bible says there was a huge earthquake. And man, the mountain shook and the rocks rolled down off the hill and slammed into the valley. And man, there was just vibration and shaking everywhere about a, a 10 on the Richter scale. And then, then the Bible just casually says, but God wasn't in that earthquake. Hmm. And then a fire broke out. And it said the fire rolled up into heaven. And I could just imagine it going up two or three miles and spreading out for miles in each direction and soot falling all over the place. And, and just great big blazing fire just burned up hundreds of acres of ground and timber. And then just casually said, but God wasn't in the fire. And then it says a tornado, called it a whirlwind, came through there. Just making a big path a half a mile long and 25 miles down there, just ripping and tearing everything, and just ripping the trees and twisting them all around, and just moving all of everything out of, the, out of its sight. And then the Lord said, the word, the word says, God was not in the tornado or the whirlwind. And then it says, God spoke in the still, small voice. Now, if we're here on the back side of the desert, we quieted ourselves down to where you can hear a pin drop, why would God holler? <laughs> I mean, I've been sitting in church like where you are with my wife, and the preacher would say, let's all stand together, and I want to uh, have the choir sing a verse of an imitation song, and if God has spoken to your heart, you want to slip down here and find you a little place to meet with God and pray? And my wife said, <laughs> let, let, let me out, Tom. I said, where are you going, babe? I, I get down the altar. God really spoke to my heart. Really? Man, I stand right there next to her. I didn't hear him. <laughs> Isn't that strange? When God speaks to you in a church service, you're the only one who knows it. You know, uh, a lot of times it's been me. I'd start out and my wife grab a hold of my Where are you going? Where are you going? I said, God really spoke to my heart. She didn't hear him. And then something. Uh, 
You know, um, man, he that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith. You, you fellas, a, you, you fellas have it like I do. Uh, uh, my wife say to me, uh, "Honey, I say what?" She says, "I wish you'd get yourself a hearing aid." I said, "I don't need to get a hearing aid. I just need you not to start talking until I start listening." Now, we've got to learn to listen. The Lord said, Moses, Moses, why did he say that twice? I don't know, but he always did. You remember in Genesis 22? Abraham, Abraham, he actually said Abram, Abram. He finally changed his name to Abraham. Twice, why did he say that twice? Um, in Genesis 28, Jacob, Jacob, why did he say that twice? In 1 Samuel 3, Samuel, Samuel, Acts chapter 9, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Uh, Mark chapter 10, Martha, Martha, uh, in, um, I guess it's uh, Mark, maybe, Luke, Luke 22, Simon, Simon, Satan hath desired thee to sift thee as wheat, but I prayed for thee. Uh, remember on the cross? Eli, Eli, my God, my God. You remember when Jesus talked to Nicodemus? Verily, verily, truly, truly, double truth, double importance, double significance. Why do you always say that twice? I, I think I learned. I'm not sure that it was this way, but I was walking through the Atlanta airport. I got off an airplane down on <clears throat> Concourse A, gate one or two way down there at the end and my next gate was gate D 46 14 mile away <laughs> they do that on purpose <laughs> and I had a briefcase in this hand and I had a top coat on this hand and I was walking down one of those hallways in the Atlanta airport and there was a guy walking right alongside of me and he had a top coat and a briefcase and I looked over and grinned at him he grinned at me we both understood and we, just, we didn't say anything we just kept going and in a few minutes, the PA system came on, and it went, Mr. And I said to him, excuse me, buddy, did that guy say Tom Wallace? He said, man, I don't know what the guy said. I wasn't listening. It came on again. It always comes on again. I've never heard a PA system announcement that they didn't repeat it. And the second one, when he came on, it said, Mr. John Watkins, would you please contact your office? I looked at him and laughed, and he looked at me. They didn't want Tom Wallace, they wanted John Watkins, but I could have sworn they said Tom Wallace. But I, I wasn't listening. I had a deacon's meeting going on in my head. And I had two or three problems bouncing around in my thinking capacity. And I had uh, 10 or 15 things going on. And I usually always do. And uh, when a guy said, you know. And then when he said the second time, I heard him. Now, every one of us have all kinds of things going on. If we're not careful, we're chewing around on them, thinking around them while the preacher's preaching and while the spirit's working. Even while the singing's going on, we're doing all kinds of things. But if we would listen, he that hath an ear to hear. So we come in here, we come in here, and we're going to meet with God. And God's going to come on the scene, and he's going to say something. And if you come for that reason, church will start kind of getting a new appeal to it. And and first thing you know, uh, you'll be hearing some things you've never heard before. And you'll be feeling some things you haven't felt before. And the Lord said, Moses, Moses. But when the Lord said, Moses, and Moses said, huh, huh, what was that? One of you sheep learn how to talk? <laughs> and then he said at the end, Moses. And Moses said, here am I. Now what's that mean? Well, that little statement, here am I, that's an interesting statement. I pastored up near Fort Knox. We used to run buses out there. We had five busloads of soldiers that would come in to our church. And boy, it was a fruitful, wonderful ministry. Most of those guys were going right to the battlefield. And, and uh, they tell me that 
And they'd have all these young recruits all lined up. They'd bring them in there and shave their hair off their head, you know, and put the boots on them and old baggy britches and everything. And they'd get out there on the parade field, and they'd all stand up, and they'd have a little guy out there in front of them had a smoky bear hat on. They called him a drill sergeant. And he'd swell out his chest and put his arms back like that. And then he, uh, he'd be barking these orders, Attention! Forward march! Hall! Right face! You know, and man, and these guys would be responding to that. He was teaching them discipline. And then suddenly this major comes out on the field and he says, Sergeant! And the sergeant clicks his heels together, swells up his chest, rears back, and salutes and says, Yes, sir! Now, I wasn't in the military, but they tell me that that means, Major, I have no idea what you're getting ready to ask me to do, but yes, I will. Is that it? That major's in charge. This sergeant is him to obey. Okay? Maybe you're in the business world instead of the military world. Okay? What we mean here by here am I is you take a 11 and a half by 14 sheet of paper, blank on both sides, and we'd like to ask you to lay it on your desk and turn it over on side two and sign it down on the bottom right hand corner. You say, well, wait a minute. What are you going to put on that paper? I don't know. Where? I have no idea. How much? I don't know. When? I don't know. Detail? I have no idea. Anybody ever come to that place in your life yet? That's Romans 12.1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. That's Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. That's 1 Corinthians 15.31. I die daily. That's John 12.24. Except the corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. It amounts to nothing. It lives and eats and sleeps and breathes and it works and it comes back here and goes and comes and, and, and then when it dies it accomplishes nothing. It just lived and that's it. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Okay? And a dozen other good verses. Seek and commit. Yield. Yield ye yourself unto God as an instrument of righteousness. Sign the paper. Now, I would prefer, and I'm sure you would, if we get that paper and put on page one, resolution. Number one, I, God, party of the first part. Say to you, Tom Wallace, party of the second part. I'd like to call you to preach. Point number two, I will give you a great big house to live in. Point number three. Here's what your salary is going to be. Number three, four. Uh, here are the benefits of insurance and your telephone, and we're going to furnish you a car, and et cetera, et cetera. And point number six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, and on side two, all the way down to the bottom, and a place for me to sign. <laughs> and the Lord hands that to me. Now, this is the way I'd like for it to be. And I, I'm going to read that thing over, and then I'm going to read it over again, and then again, and again. I'm going to read that thing about 15 or 20 times. I'm just almost going to memorize that. And then I'm going to take that to my wife. I married again after my wife died. A couple of years went by, and the Lord gave me a beautiful wife, and we've been married now eight years. And I, I want her to look it over because she's going to be involved in whatever house we live in, whatever salary we have, and whatever benefits are. So she looks it over, and she comes and I'll tell you, Tom, now I think, nah, I, you know, I got four kids. I think I'd call all four of my kids and say, kids, look, God CP want me to do this. What do y'all think about that? And then preacher, I believe I'd call 15, 20 preacher buddies and kind of bounce it off. What do you guys think? You think, here's what the Lord seems to be saying. What do you guys, give me some advice. And you know, it wouldn't be a bad idea to get myself a lawyer. You never know when God's going to slip some fine print in on you, you know. <laughs> So, so after all this, you know, I, I come to the Lord. I say, okay, Lord, I, I think maybe I'm about ready to. And the Lord said, never mind. I'm not interested now. You forget it. You're not interested. Anybody here willing to sign a blank paper? Moses said, here am I, Lord. I don't know what you asked me to do, but I'll do it. Really? That's what he said. Well, I wonder what the Lord wants him to do. Man alive. Somebody that willing, he must have a church that's 5,000 people coming every Sunday and needs a pastor. Man. Or, boy, there's a college down here and they got 1,500 students and they need a college president. Anybody that willing, boy. Or, or man, uh, uh, maybe, maybe he's a music director and, and they, they've got a 500 voice choir. And, and this guy's going to get to lead. I mean, it is some job. 
wonder what this is going to be. And the Lord said, now Moses, are you sure? Are you willing to do it? Yes, sir. You do anything I want you to do? Yes, sir. Any place? Yeah. Any salary? Yeah. Yeah. Any conditions? Yeah. Don't matter about anything? No. Wow. I wonder what he's going to say. So, okay. You're now you're really sure? Yes, sir. Okay. All right, sit down there and take your sandals off. Take off my shoes? Yeah. That it? Yeah. Hmm. Okay. I said it would. So he sat down and took off his shoes. And the Lord said, Hey, I believe I got my man. He said, Moses, I got about two and a half, three million people down in Egypt. And I've been looking for somebody to go down there and get them for me. But I wasn't about to ask anybody to go who wouldn't be willing to take their shoes off for me. You see, does your Bible say the same thing mine does? He that is faithful in the little nothing things, I'll make him ruler over many cities. Sometimes the Lord says in a Sunday service and your preacher's preaching, and he says, let's stand together. God has spoken to your hearts. Would you slip out of your place and come down here to the front and meet with God and let him talk to you? And he's saying, he won't take his shoes off. And the Lord's moving your heart. But you say, nah, man, man, what will everybody think? It's almost lunchtime. And I, no, no. And, and we resist. Okay, okay. You'll never know about the two and a half million people down in Egypt. Sometimes the Lord asks me to do a little something insignificant, nothing thing. He just won't see if I'm listening. And if I respond to that, that opens another door. And if I respond to that, that opens another door. And after a while, you can't imagine the doors that are open and the things that God will say to me and illuminate my mind and show me things that I never otherwise would see. He that has an ear to hear, let him hear. And the Lord usually says, you want to take your shoes off? And then the Lord said, uh, Moses, uh, take your shoes off, for the ground whereon you stand is holy ground. Now, a question here, what in the world made it holy? Well, it wasn't real estate value. You could have bought all of you wanted for a couple of dollars an acre. Man, it's way out there on the backside of the desert, and there's nothing out there but scrubby little, couple little blade of grass there and there. And take a half a day for those sheep to find enough to satisfy them, you know. But I tell you what made it holy, same thing that made Abraham, Abraham, and Jacob, Jacob, and Samuel, Samuel, and Saul, Saul, and Martha, Martha, and Eli, Eli, and, and Simon, Simon. And every one of those cases, without exception, God came down and met with an individual human being and gave some kind of a message, some kind of a leading, okay? Now, uh, <clears throat> we've come here tonight, and this is just our regular Wednesday night service. It's wonderful to be in the house of God, and then we come back on Sunday morning, Sunday night. And my Bible says up there in Nashville, I read my Bible, and I think your Bible down here in Mississippi probably says pretty well the same thing. It says, if two or more of you are gathered together in my midst, I am there in your midst also. God is here. That's what this book says. You feel him? You hear him? Be aware of him? Or is this just a matter of come to church and hear something and sing a couple songs and go through a motion and then go on our way and go about our business? It gets to be that if you're not real careful. But if I could suddenly become aware that God is here every time I come in this place, we could get goosebumps again. And, and, and God would speak to us about things that you know, we've missed. And it wouldn't be just habit and routine and come and go. It'd be, man, I'm going to get over there and I, I want to get ready to hear God. Holy ground. Okay? Because God is here. And he'll be here again Sunday for Sunday school. And he'll be here again Sunday morning when the preacher preaches and when the choir sings. And if you'll listen, if you get to where Moses was. God will set that bush on fire and I mean you won't be able to wait to get here because this will be an exciting experience. Let's stand together with the heads bowed and our eyes closed.